Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Action's webinar, Learn, Share, Act, the Lymphedema Treatment Act. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Saru Kaiser, and I'm the Program Manager here at Breast Cancer Action. Joining me on the webinar today will be Heather Ferguson, who's the Founder and Executive Director of the Lymphedema Advocacy Group. Before we get started, I just have a few quick announcements. Breast Cancer Action doesn't take money from any corporation that profits from or contributes to the breast cancer epidemic. Our work is largely supported by individual donors like you. Please consider making a $25 donation today to support work like these educational webinars. Our presentation of Learn, Share, Act, the Lymphedema Treatment Act will last about 45 minutes. At any time during the webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the question bar over on your right-hand side. We'll save time at the end to answer as many questions as we can. We want you to get involved with Breast Cancer Action, and this webinar is a great way to do that. Stay tuned for other ways we'll mention later on in the webinar. I'm going to start by running through what we're going to talk about today. So Heather's going to talk about what is lymphedema. She's going to also talk about the importance of coverage for treatment for lymphedema. And then she's going to take some time to explain what the Lymphedema Treatment Act is and how you can get involved in helping get it passed. And then I'm going to talk about breast cancer and lymphedema specifically. And we'll end again with your questions. I want to take a moment just to talk about Breast Cancer Action. We were founded in 1990 by a group of women living with breast cancer who realized the power of community. They founded the organization because they saw a need for a grassroots organization with a unique understanding of the political, economic, and social context of breast cancer. Our founders, only one of whom is still alive today, knew that their private medical crises was really part of a larger public health emergency and that the experiences of those dealing with breast cancer needed to be heard to address this crisis. We are the only organization that addresses the breast cancer epidemic at the intersection of breast cancer, the environment, social justice, and feminism. And our mission is to achieve health justice for all women at risk of and living with breast cancer. I want to take a moment just to talk about the core values that guide all of the work that we do here at Breast Cancer Action. We believe that health justice is a human right. We believe in honesty, fearlessness, and truth-telling about the breast cancer epidemic and honoring women's diverse voices and lived experiences. We believe in putting people's health and well-being over corporate profits, and we believe in transparency and accountability for ourselves and others. We also believe that collective action really changes the world for the better. And last, we have integrity and freedom from conflict of interest. So we recognize here at Breast Cancer Action how the issues of health and social justice are really intertwined to the work that we do. And it really forms a foundation for our core values, which I just sort of went through, around ending the breast cancer epidemic. That's why we've made a real clear commitment to social justice as a foundation of all of our work. And I want to talk about what that means to us as an organization. The first is that we know that the breast cancer epidemic impacts communities unequally and leads to unacceptable differences in who develops breast cancer and when it develops, who gets high quality and timely treatment, and who dies from breast cancer. We also know that in order to address and end the breast cancer epidemic, we really have to tackle the root causes of health inequities and inequalities, which are often the result of a complex interplay of culture, power, economics, racism, and sexism. We also believe that there's no single injustice that can be effectively addressed in isolation. And we really recognize that injustices in our society reinforce each other and reinforce uh, in many different ways and at many different levels. And last but not least, in our work for health justice, we really strive to be an ally by using the power and privilege we hold as an organization to build solidarity with communities who currently or traditionally have had less access to power information and resources. So that's a lot about sort of the, the values of uh, why we do the work we do. I want to take a moment to talk about the issues that we work on. So as the watchdog for the breast cancer movement, we educate, organize, and take action for systemic change in three distinct areas. The first is really our work on breast cancer screening, diagnosis, and treatment, which examines the data from a patient perspective 
and includes issues such as breast cancer screening, healthcare access, drug and device approval, and really demands for more effective, less costly, and less toxic treatments. The next is around our work to address the root causes of breast cancer and the breast cancer epidemic. And this focuses on eliminating involuntary exposures to hazardous and toxic chemicals present in all of our daily lives that really put us at risk for an increased risk of breast cancer. And the last is around pink ribbon marketing and culture, which often exploits a disease that devastates communities, misrepresents who is affected by breast cancer, and excludes and marginalizes women's diverse lived experiences of this disease. We address the true impact that breast cancer has on women's lives and their communities. So before I hand it over to Heather, I want to tell you a little bit about her. She's the founder and executive director of the Lymphedema Advocacy Group. Her relationship with lymphedema began in 2006 with the birth of her twin boys, one of which was born with primary lymphedema. Her desire to advocate on behalf of lymphedema patients took root upon learning of the problems with insurance coverage for lymphedema treatment. She founded the Lymphedema Advo Advocacy Group, whose mission is to advance lymphedema care in the United States by advocating for improved insurance coverage for the diagnosis and treatment of the disease. She's a recipient of the Lymphatic Education and Research Network's Wendy Chait Leadership Award, the National Lymphedema Network's Legislative Excellence Award, and she's a graduate of the Lymph Science Advocacy Program. Welcome to the webinar, Heather. I'm going to turn it now over to you. Thanks, Saru, and my thanks to Breast Cancer Action for organizing this webinar and inviting me to be a part of it. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk to you about lymphedema and about the Lymphedema Treatment Act, because this is something that's very near and dear to me. Next. Oh, there we go. Um, these are photos of my twin boys a few years ago. Dylan, who has lymphedema, is on the right. And in this photo, he's wearing a waist-high compression stocking. He was born with swelling. And it took several agonizing months to finally get a proper diagnosis for him. The struggle we went through was chronicled in a story that appeared in the Washington Post last fall. So if you're interested in reading that, you can look for this picture, which is on the home page of our website, and click on it, and that will take you to the story. Like many people, when they're diagnosed with lymphedema, we had never heard of the word and had no understanding of what lymphedema was. Lymphedema is a chronic swelling edema caused by a buildup of fluid, in this case, lymph fluid, that occurs when the lymphatic system is either faulty or damaged. There is currently no cure for lymphedema, but it can be effectively treated. Many different people are at risk for lymphedema, but the most common cause is cancer treatments that remove or damage lymph nodes or vessels. This kind of lymphedema is called secondary lymphedema. What my son has is called primary lymphedema because it's the result of a congenital defect or a congenital malformation of the lymphatic system. Mm -hmm. Other common causes include other kinds of surgery, trauma, and accidents that damage the lymph nodes or a lot of the lymph vessels. There's an estimated 3 to 5 million Americans in total who have lymphedema. And regardless of the cause of their lymphedema or whether it's primary or secondary, all cases of lymphedema are treated the same way. The goal of treatment is to reduce the swelling in the affected body part or parts and then maintain that reduction through the use of compression therapy. If lymphedema is untreated or is undertreated, it is progressive, meaning that swelling is going to continue to worsen, and that puts the patient at ever-increasing risk of serious infections, which sometimes require hospitalization, loss of mobility and function, and other complications. For us, finding out that our insurance company wasn't going to cover the compression supplies that my son would need for the rest of his life was just devastating. I couldn't understand as a mother how our insurance company could not cover something that would prevent such serious complications. And I know for many cancer survivors, it's just adds insult to injury that 
the very cancer treatment that saved their lives created this lymphedema, and now they have to live with this lymphedema for the rest of their life, but yet they don't have the support through the insurance coverage to access the treatment supplies that they need. At this point, I decided that rather than battle our insurance company for the rest of my son's life and have him inherit this problem when he was an adult, that I would rather put my time and energy into fixing the problem for my son and for all patients like him. So I founded the Lymphedema Advocacy Group. We are a nationwide, all-volunteer, nonprofit organization of patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals, and industry partners. And our primary objective is to get coverage for these vital compression supplies through passage of the Lymphedema Treatment Act. To understand why we have this problem, you need to realize that the root of the problem is that Medicare does not cover these compression supplies. And the reason they do not cover them is because they don't fit the definition of any of their benefit categories. So they do not last as long as typical durable medical equipment, which needs to have a three-year lifespan. Yet they're not disposable items because they're not single use. They typically last about six months. And they're not consumable. They're not an oral medication. So they don't meet the classic definition of any of these categories. So therefore, because of this technicality, Medicare is unable to cover these items. Consequently, many other insurance plans fail to cover them as well because Medicare sets the standard that so many other insurance policies follow. The one group of patients that do most often have coverage for their compression supplies are breast cancer survivors who are women. Um, and that is thanks to the Women's, and Health, Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 1998. Um, unfortunately, this act does not apply to Medicare. So even if you've had coverage through your private insurer, you will lose it upon reaching Medicare age. It also does not apply to men. So even if you are a male breast cancer survivor, um, you will not have coverage for your compression supplies. And ironically, um, the insurance companies who adhere to the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act usually do not cover compression supplies for any of their other policyholders. So that was true in the case of my son. They would have covered a compression sleeve for me if I had lymphedema as a result of breast cancer, but they would not cover a compression garment for my child, despite the fact that I explained to them it was the same disease and it was the same treatment that was needed, they would not budge, which was very frustrating. So as I said, rather than just continually battle with our insurance company, I wanted to fix the problem. So the first thing I did was approach my then state representative, Tricia Cotham, about passing a lymphedema treatment mandate in our state of North Carolina. And we did that. We introduced and passed that bill in 2009. So since 2010, all private insurance policies sold in the state of North Carolina are required to cover these compression supplies. State mandates do not apply to Medicare, however. So we cannot go through all 50 states just passing these state laws in the hopes of getting coverage for all patients. Um, and whether or not these state mandates apply to a state's Medicaid program is a gray area, and it varies from state to state. So in my state of North Carolina, our Medicaid program does cover compression garments and supplies. In Virginia, however, which is the only other state that has a true lymphedema treatment mandate, their Medicaid program does not. So the big fix, as I've said, is really getting the Medicare coverage for these supplies. So after passing the North Carolina bill, I approached my then Congressman Larry Kissel about introducing this federal bill, which he obviously agreed to do. And the first version of the Lymphedema Treatment Act was introduced into Congress in 2010. So the Lymphedema Treatment Act is a federal bill in Congress that will enable Medicare to cover the doctor-prescribed compression supplies 
needed to treat lymphedema, and it will do so by enabling them to be covered under the durable medical equipment benefit category. Even though they do not last three years, it will make an exception for these items only so that they have a benefit category to be covered under. The bill will include coverage for all types of compression supplies. So all of your bandaging supplies, custom or standard fit compression garments at any level of compression, whatever is prescribed by the doctor, as well as custom or standard fit day and nighttime compression alternatives. These would be your items that often Velcro on, um, that are frequently used at night, but sometimes also in the daytime for patients who can either not tolerate a compression garment or are not able to don a compression garment. There's also a clause in the bill that's very important that will enable the Health and Human Services Secretary to add new items to coverage in the future. So if a new product is developed that doesn't ma exactly match these descriptions mm -hmm. but is effective in the treatment of lymphedema, it gives the secretary the authority to add those items to coverage as well so that we would never be in the position of having to pass legislation again to get coverage for our lymphedema treatment supplies. What the bill does not do is dictate things such as how many compression garments a patient can have at one time, how frequently those items can be replaced, and what those items will cost. Those things are part of the regulatory process that are determined after the bill is passed into law. And those are things that need to be flexible. So those are things we don't want set in stone by being part of the law. Because as products change over time, their longevity may increase or decrease. New products that are not even on the market yet might be different than the ones that we currently use today. So we want those things to remain flexible so those things are not written into the law. And once again, even though this bill is specific to changing Medicare law, it will help all patients because that Medicare coverage will set that new precedent for coverage that all other insurances look to as the standard. Our bill here in the 114th Congress um, is, is sponsored by Congressman Dave Reichert in the House and Senator Maria Cantwell in the Senate. And joining those lead sponsors are a group of co-leads which are perfectly positioned to support passage of these, bill, of these bills. So these members of Congress collectively represent a Democrat and a Republican from each of the committees that our bill has been referred to in both the House and the Senate. So this is the strongest possible leadership team we could have for our bill, and we're very grateful to have them. You can see that our House bill was introduced in March of last year, and our Senate bill was introduced in December of uh, excuse me, December of this year, yeah, and, the, and uh, the House bill in 2015. And you can also note the bill numbers here, but keep in mind that the bill numbers do change over time. Each time, uh, each cycle of Congress is two years. Any bill that is not passed within that two-year cycle automatically dies and has to be reintroduced in the next session of Congress. In the process of being reintroduced, it is assigned a new bill number. So these are our bill numbers for this session of Congress only. Pictured here is our lead House sponsor, Congressman Dave Reichert, with several members of our board. And just as a reminder, this is an all grassroots, patient-driven effort. So we really need everyone to get involved in supporting passage of this bill. The most important action you can take is contacting your members of Congress and asking them to co-sponsor the bill, especially this year because it's an election year. Um, members are very interested in hearing from their constituents. We have a number of different tools on our website to help you 
make contact with your members of Congress. The first and most important one is to write them. We have a form on our website that has a pre-written template letter for you, although it's ideal if you personalize that letter by explaining why this issue is so important to you. And then you simply need to fill in your name and your address. You don't even have to know the names of your representative and your senators because it will match you to your congressional district based on the address that you give. And so this process is as simple as signing a petition, but it's so much better because this letter actually goes directly to these congressional offices. The next action you can take is calling your congressional offices. And this is incredibly important because it's much easier to send an email letter nowadays than it is to pick up the phone. So consequently, offices receive far fewer phone calls. And when you do call, it carries more weight and gets more attention. So similar to the form to writing, we have another form on our website where you can enter your zip code. And it will give you the phone number of the offices. It will give you the name of the staff member to ask for. And it will give you a list of talking points. So you're going to be asking to talk to the health legislative aide. But usually that person is not available to come to the phone at that moment. So you're going to just be leaving a message and asking for a call back. So it only takes a couple minutes of your time. But just logging that call and is, is so impactful. I really encourage you to take a couple minutes to call each of your congressional offices and leave a message about why this bill is so important to you and asking them to sign on as a co-sponsor. You can also reach out to your members of Congress via social media. We have a page on our website that lists all of the Facebook and Twitter accounts for members of Congress. And we also offer sample posts and tweets. So you can simply copy and paste and use ours. Or you can write your own message and then just click on the link to your members of Congress's social media accounts. And last but not least is attending a meeting at your members' nearest local offices, especially because we're about to enter into a very long recess period leading up to the election. Members are home in their districts and eager to meet with constituents and try to win their votes. So this is a perfect time to try and schedule a meeting at your local office. We have another page on our website dedicated to supporting you doing this. There are simple instructions on how you can schedule this meeting, how to prepare for this meeting, materials that you can print and bring with you to your meeting. And if you'd like someone to join you, we can help to connect you with other advocates in your area who could join you at this meeting as well. Both of our House and Senate bills enjoy strong bipartisan support. And if you want to see if any of your members of Congress are already co-sponsors of the bill, you can just look for any of the current status links on our website. The easiest place to find this information will be over on the left-hand side of the website. There is a little box dedicated to this. It says current status. And then there's one link to the House bill and one link to the Senate bill. I'm often asked how many co-sponsors we need. And there is no magic number, but the more, the better. The more co-sponsors we have, the greater our chance of getting this bill passed during this Congress. So we've set a very high goal for ourselves of 60%, which is the supermajority in each chamber. If you look at this picture on the left here, you can see that we have 233 House co-sponsors which is 88% of the way to our goal. So we're doing great in the House. In the Senate, we actually have 21 co-sponsors uh, as of today. So we're about a third of the way to our goal. And the reason there is that difference between the House and the Senate is because our House bill was introduced much earlier in this Congress than our Senate bill. And we've also been working on a House bill for multiple Congresses. So our House bill dates all the way back to 2010. So even though co-sponsors do not carry over from one Congress to the next, in most cases, once an office has co-sponsored, 
they're much more inclined to do so again in the next Congress. So it makes it easier and easier to get more support with each uh, passing Congress. Some progress of note is that our bill was recently included in a hearing entitled Legislation to Improve and Sustain the Medicare Program. That was held on June 8th, and it was a hearing by the House Ways and Means Health Subcommittee. So this is one of the committees that our bill has been referred to. And this is a picture of our lead House sponsor, Congressman Dave Reichert. There is a couple reasons why having had this hearing was significant for us. It may lead to us being included into a package of Medicare bills that the House is working on putting together. So there were dozens of bills heard at this hearing and many more Medicare-related bills introduced in Congress this year. And so this subcommittee will be taking a look at, look at those and putting together a package of several of those bills with the goal of possibly trying to pass that package later this year after the election but before the end of this Congress. So that's one possible way our bill might be passed in the House. Another um, possible avenue for our bill to move, now that it's had a hearing, is that our lead sponsor, Congressman Reichert, now has the option of attaching our bill to another bill or another package that might be moving, perhaps, before this Medicare package does. So our, a bill like ours, because it's very small in the big scope of things, will not ever move to the House floor to be passed on its own. We are dependent upon being included in a bundle or being tacked on to another piece of legislation. So now that we've had this hearing, it opens up the opportunity for those things to happen. So contacting your own members of Congress is the most important thing that you can do to help us pass the Lymphedema Treatment Act. But there's a number of other ways you can also get involved and support passage of this bill. We need as many people as possible contacting their members of Congress. So we want you to encourage your friends, family members, colleagues, doctors, therapists, anyone you know who might care about this issue or just care about it because it's important to you. Um, we want them contacting their members of Congress as well. So to help you share the word about, about the bill and how easy it is for them to take action, we have some free information cards. Pictured here is our larger card. You can see it has information more specific to the Lymphedema Treatment Act on the front, and then more general information about lymphedema on the back. We also have a smaller business size card. Again, both these size cards are, are completely free. And you can order them through our website via a link that's on the Increasing Awareness page. Also on that Increasing Awareness page, there's other items that you can download and print. For example, the six things you may not know about lymphedema infographic can be printed out on a standard sheet of paper. And we also have a Spanish version of that infographic as well. So these items and others are available on the Increasing Awareness page of our website. Another way that you can support our efforts to pass the Lymphedema Treatment Act is by sharing your lymphedema story. So this book here is one that we just printed for that hearing that I just talked to you about. This book contains over 400 personal stories from patients all around the country. And we gave this to our sponsor, Dave Reichert, to share with his colleagues for this hearing. We will be printing other versions of the book as you know, other important events occur as our bill progresses. So if you'd like to be included in a later edition of this book, we'd love to have your story. We also have a form for submitting your stories on the website. So it'll give you some uh, pointers on the most important information to to include to help support our efforts to pass this bill. Another way you can get involved is by joining your state's advocacy team. We have grassroots teams in all 50 states. It doesn't cost a thing to join, and the time commitment is completely up to you. 
It doesn't matter how little or how much time you have to give, every little bit helps move us closer to our goal. So it's a great way to connect with others who have a, a shared interest in your area, and especially um, to connect with others to attend those in-person district meetings that I told you about. So all of the things that I've mentioned here today and other ways that you can get involved are all listed under the How You Can Help menu on our website, which looks like this picture here on the left-hand side. Um, and again, our website is lymphedematreatmentact.org. So a final note here about why we really hope that you'll take action today. We are closer than we ever have been to passing this bill during this Congress. We have a huge amount of support um, with our co-sponsorship. We've had a hearing in the House. We have bills in both chambers. So we're really poised to get this done this year. However, as I explained, a bill like ours won't go to the floor and be voted on alone. So we are dependent upon another vehicle for our bill to move. Either that's going to be in a bundle with other bills or being tacked on to a larger piece of legislation. So those are things that are, to a large extent, out of our control. But what is in our control is having the greatest number of co-sponsors possible. And that's going to be one of the key things that the committee chairs and the leadership looks at when deciding whether or not to attach our bill to another or bundle it into a package. So we really need as many people as possible to get involved, take action during this Congress, get all of your members of Congress on, your representatives, and both of your senators. Very important to us. However, if we do not pass the bill this year, of course we will reintroduce it next, next year in the next Congress and continue to work until we do get this passed. We'll be taking some questions at the end of the webinar, but if we don't have time to get to yours, or if you think of one after the webinar is over, or if you're listening to a recording of this, please feel free to email me anytime. There's also a contact form on our website, and of course there's a lot more information on our website than we've had time to cover today. I'm going to turn it back over to Saru, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, and like Heather said, we will open it up to your questions in a little bit. I want to take a moment to talk about the connection between lymphedema and breast cancer and, and really why this issue is really important to our organization. Brett, now, lymphedema, when it develops in uh, people who have um, undergone breast cancer surgery is usually in the arm or the hand, but sometimes uh, people are affected in the breast or the underarm, their whole chest, the whole trunk of their body, or even just in their back. And so there's a number of places where uh, lymphedema can occur. And one of the issues that we see in breast cancer, but also with, um, I think, other um, diseases and other um, problems where lymphedema can occur or even with um, primary lymphedema is that it's really, it goes unrecognized and it's very much underdiagnosed. And, and there's a, a number of reasons for this. Um, a few that I'll talk about is that there's really no standard screening tool for lymphedema, um, which means that there's really no standard way to diagnose it. Um, it also, an, another sort of part of this issue is that doctors and medical providers in general are really undereducated about the lymphatic system in general and also the issues and the problem of lymphedema, both what are some early signs of it, um, some of the prevention options, and also just making sure that, that patients and, and women know that there might be some signs they can look for in order to uh, sort of get ahead of it. Um, another problem is just the lack of information and, and the lack of what we know about lymphedema, the causes, the uh, sort of where it comes from, how it develops, what are the, are there ways to prevent it. Um, and when we also look at ethnically diverse populations, there's very little information 
especially when we're looking at some long-term follow-up, which is really important when, when I think looking at research on, on any illness or disease is really understanding what are the long-term implications um, of, uh, of lymphedema. Some other issues just um, regarding lymphedema and breast cancer is it develops in approximately 20 to 40 percent of women uh, after treatment for breast cancer, and that's specifically thinking about uh, breast cancer surgery. Um, and, and that number is, uh, there's a big difference between 20% and 40%, and I think 20% is a pretty standard figure thrown out there, but there's been some recent, some recent studies um, that have shown that two out of five breast cancer patients will develop lymphedema within five years of surgery. So there, those rates are um, sort of changing uh, as new information comes in, and it uh, starts to, um, or tell a different picture of, of what this looks like. Um, again, that variation is both due to just the lack of information, but again, it goes back to not having a standard way to diagnose lymphedema, not really understanding uh, what lymphedema looks like uh, and, and sometimes even feels like. We do know that uh, overall, 80 to 90 percent of women who do develop lymphedema will do so within three years of breast cancer surgery, but they are still at risk years later. So even if they don't develop it within those that three-year period, there is the possibility that they can uh, develop it many, many years later. And when we look at the actual types of surgery where uh, lymphedema is one of the uh, potential uh, side effects, there are sort of two main surgeries. We're looking at the axillary lymph node dissection and then the sentinel node biopsy. And there, there's some difference in them, and there's some difference in the risk for lymphedema. But when you look at both of these, um, what uh, research has shown is that overall survival is not impacted, um, but there definitely are different side effects depending on which one. I'm just going to walk through a couple of differences between them. So the uh, sentinel node biopsy uh, is usually no more than four nodes are impacted or damaged uh, or removed. So it's a, a less invasive type of surgery. And with this type of surgery, there's really much lower rates of lymphedema. And, and some more recent studies have shown that fewer than 5% of women will develop lymphedema one year after breast surgery. And then when we look at the axillary lymph node dissection, there is more node involvement. Um, it means more nodes are being damaged or mo more nodes are being removed. It's therefore a little more invasive. And women who uh, have this type of surgery are, are three times more likely to develop lymphedema than those who have had a sentinel node biopsy. And there are different reasons why um, women have one versus the other. But I think this is really good information for patients to know to ask their medical provider why they are recommending one over the other um, and to really understand what are the benefits of having one over the other and what are the harms. And that's, a, I think, important part of making a decision, especially when thinking about, uh, you know, the, um, the impacts of uh, potentially getting diagnosed with lymphedema. And then uh, I, I think in just thinking about what do we do based on what what is the information that we know right now, and, and I think Heather did a, a really wonderful job of telling us more about the Lymphedema Treatment Act and, and the good that that would do for everyone around insurance coverage. But I think there's some issues around patients and women even receiving information that lymphedema is a potential uh, possible risk that they may need to look for after breast cancer surgery. So um, it's really, uh, I think, important that all patients receive information about lymphedema risk, uh, not only at the time of a breast cancer diagnosis when there's a lot of information uh, that's coming at women, but also uh, before and after a surgery happens and also with follow-up uh, visits. Uh, it's an important part to continue to help um, women pay attention to the potential risks of, of lymph, for lymphedema. 
And I think um, medical providers and physicians really play a pivotal role as educators. Um, they can uh, let breast cancer patients know about the risks, um, that, that, that it's even possible to get secondary lymphedema from breast cancer surgery, that there are some prevention strategies and there are some early signs and symptoms to look for, and then if it does develop, that there are treatment options. Um, and, and what those are, and, and how, to, how to access them. And yet, again, there are many doctors who are still really undereducated, not only about lymphedema, but sometimes about um, some of these methods of early signs and symptoms and prevention. The one um, thing I do want to call out is a myth that uh, has been disproven, which is many women were told for a very long time not to exercise uh, once they had uh, a diagnosis of secondary lymphedema, and that, um, has, that myth has been disproven, scientifically disproven, that uh, exercise uh, in, in some cases and in, in certain, certain types of exercise have actually shown to help with, um, with lymphedema. And, uh, some of the uh, issues around lymphedema, and so it's important to talk to your medical provider about, um, about that if, if you are being told not to exercise. And the last, I just want to, again, uh, go back to uh, plugging the lymphedema treatment act. It's really so important that uh, what we do know to treat lymphedema is these compression garments and making sure that everyone has access to them is, is really important. And I think it's, for us as an organization, it's a, it's a real health justice issue. So Breast Cancer Action also has a complimentary action and letter that you can send to both your senator to get them to support the Senate bill and to your House of Representatives uh, to support the House bill. And it's, uh, our letter uh, talks uh, about many of the similar things because it is a complimentary bill to the Lymphedema Advocacy Group. But there are some specifics around concerns of women at risk of and living with breast cancer. So you can uh, check that out on our website if you're interested. So I just want to touch on a few resources um, that have been mentioned or alluded to through this webinar. The first, obviously, is Heather's group, Lymphedema Advocacy Group. Um, you can go to their website and find out just so much information about uh, some of the sort of facts around lymphedema, um, information about how to get involved if you would like to do some advocacy around supporting the Lymphedema Treatment Act and um, possibly getting your state uh, legislator to sign on if they haven't already. And there's a lot, a lot of really great resources on their website. You can go to Breast Cancer Action. Again, I mentioned we have a complimentary action on our website. We also have a lot of information about uh, many different issues that relate to breast cancer if you're interested in exploring. And then the last is the National Lymphedema Network website, which also, again, is a really good resource to know and learn more about lymphedema. So those are some uh, sort of easy to, easy to read, easy to, to access resources after this webinar if you'd like to find out more. So we're going to be opening it up to your questions in uh, just a minute. But before we do, I really uh, want to talk a little bit about how you can get more involved with Breast Cancer Action if you're interested. You can uh, become a member. You can sign up for our news and action e-alerts from us and keep up to date on all the issues we work on, including Lymphedema Treatment Act. You can join us on Facebook and Twitter to connect with others and help change the conversation about the breast cancer epidemic. You can also help others get involved. You can tell your friends, your coworkers, your family uh, about this webinar and how they can take action. We do record all of our webinars and make them available on our website. And last is uh, you can donate to support our education and advocacy work. Like I uh, mentioned in the beginning, we really rely on your support. Um, and it's part of what makes these webinars possible. If you've been inspired today, you can uh, consider making a donation of $25 or more so we can continue um, educational services like these webinars. You can go to bcaction.org uh, slash donate. I want to give a really big thank you to Heather for her presentation today. And now I want to open it up to your questions and have time to uh, see what questions this webinar has brought up for you. 
So as I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, you can type your questions at any time during the webinar. We have a couple of questions we'll start with, but uh, please continue to type your questions uh, as we uh, are answering questions. And we, uh, as long as we have time in the webinar, we'll make sure we can get to all of them. So there's a question that says, um, it seems to be quite important to help low-income women, but we're starting with women 65 and older by trying to include compression coverage in Medicare. Can you talk a little bit more about why, um, why it's so important to, to start with Medicare? And Heather, I think that's to you. <laughs> OK. So as I said, Medicare sets the standard for all other insurance policies. So it is the single best way we can improve insurance coverage for every patient, regardless of age, gender, cause of their lymphedema, you know, what have you. Now, of course, insurance coverage does not help someone if someone is uninsured. So that is a separate problem. Um, however, right now there are several uh, assistance programs, and they're inundated with requests for assistance uh, with compression garments because they are largely not covered by insurance. So if we had the insurance coverage, those assistance programs could really just focus on assisting the uninsured patients. So you know, in that indirect way, this improvement to the, to the coverage would help those patients as well. Great. That's, that's uh, really helpful to know. Can you talk about how um, this relates uh, specifically? Um, because the person mentioned uh, low-income women, if you can mention how this relates to Medicaid as well. Yes. So Medicaid, um, the reason it's a gray area in terms of coverage is because Medicaid programs are funded with a mix of state and federal money. So it's usually at the state's discretion whether or not their Medicaid program is going to ally or align more with the standards set by the federal government, which would be Medicare, or with the standards that they've set for private policies within their state. And hence why we have this discrepancy with North Carolina and Virginia, with both having state laws requiring coverage for these items, but yet one state's Medicaid program North Carolina follows more of the standards that they want for the private insured, and they cover garments, whereas Virginia's Medicaid program aligns themselves with the standards set by Medicare. And so despite having that mandate for the private insurers, the patients on Medicaid still don't have coverage for their garments. Great. Thank you. And someone asks, um, you mentioned Virginia and North Carolina. Are those the only two states that have a state-mandated coverage for uh, compression garments? Those are the only two states that have true lymphedema treatment mandates. But there are two other states to date that have passed legislation that has improved coverage for compression supplies. One is the state of Louisiana uh, passed a provision that requires that private insurers give their um, uh, customers the option of buying coverage that would include coverage for compression supplies. So it's kind of an add-on, I guess. Um, and, it all, and they also, in a separate effort, succeeded in convincing uh, their state Medicaid program to cover compression garments because they were not before. Uh, the other state is California. California, in anticipation of the Affordable Care Act going into effect, they wanted to pass their own legislation to further define what had to be covered as part of the essential benefits package. So in the process of doing that, the state legislature pointed to a benchmark plan, which happened to be a plan that included coverage for compression supplies because a longtime lymphedema advocate named Bob White in the state of California had years before convinced that private insurer that those items should be covered. So in that very indirect way, coverage for compression supplies was improved in California, even though the legislation that did so um, had nothing to do with lymphedema specifically. There's also other states that have been working on passing 
state legislation. Some have active bills in their state legislature, but no other states have passed anything yet. Um, and so the state legislation is a, is a beneficial way, obviously, for uh, improving coverage for some of the patients in their state. State legislation obviously can be passed much more quickly than federal legislation, but it's not the end all be all. Even if we had mandates in all 50 states, we still would not have Medicare patients with coverage, and we still would not have many Medicaid patients without coverage. Great, thank you. Um, the, someone asked, uh, you were talking about sort of the congressional cycle, the two-year congressional cycle, and given that we're sort of coming to the end of this um, two-year cycle, uh, are legislators still signing on to support? Have you found that there, there are less because there is this feeling of, you know, we're coming to the end? Um, and also they, they ask, you know, have you had any new uh, legislative sign-ons to uh, co-sponsor this, either either piece, either in the House or the Senate. Right. Yeah, no, our, um, our momentum in terms of gaining co-sponsors has not slowed at all as we've come closer to the end of this congressional cycle. Um, you know, I mean, who knows what goes on in their minds, but based on just, you know, there's the responses we're getting, we don't see that as being a deterrent for any office to sign on, especially if, if they see the history of the bill that we've been working on this since 2010. They realize we're going to reintroduce in the next Congress. It's not going to be done over with at the end of this year, no matter what happens. So, um, you know, we're, it's, it's more far-sighted than that. Um, and we're in a difficult period right now because we are getting so close to the election that things are, if it's even possible, moving even slower <laughs> in Congress because uh, members often do not want to vote on things right before voters are going to the polls. So we do anticipate that it will be more productive in that lame duck session after the election and before the end of the year. Um, so, you know, that's really our, our best window at this point for our bill possibly getting passed this year is during that uh, period where, where things are likely to be moving more because no one's worrying about how it might affect the vote. Great. Thank you. Uh, someone asked uh, a question about the recording, so I'm just going to mention it again. Uh, we record all of our webinars and we make them available on our website. They're usually posted about a week after, sometimes a little sooner, uh, on our website. And uh, an email will go out to everyone who's registered and attended our webinars and uh, with that link. Uh, so they'll be able to have it either to watch again or to pass on to friends. So thank you for that question. Um, someone wanted to know, um, is, are there places where you feel like uh, more support is needed or you're looking to sort of, um, or you, you don't have the uh, legislators uh, who have signed on in specific areas of the country? Um, you know, we have a national, a national audience and sometimes there are people on the call who might actually live in those states. Right. Great question. Um, so because we're a grassroots effort, we've you know, relied on word of mouth and just social media and stuff to spread the word. And it seems that the word has been slowest in getting to some of the Midwestern and Western states um, and the more rural areas. So um, we could definitely use more voices, more advocacy coming from those areas of the country. We have a lot of members on our state teams in the East Coast and the West Coast states and the more um, metropolitan areas, but often in the rural areas they don't have the big um, cancer centers, which are likely to be you know, hubs of information and where information is exchanged and stuff. And so, States like Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, a little bit in, the, in that kind of region of the country, we could definitely um, benefit from those members of Congress hearing from more constituents and having more involvement in those areas. Great. Um, and there's a question, um, Heather, I'd love to hear your thoughts and then I can add mine. Um, 
someone was asking about the sort of the, the research aspect into lymphedema and um, you know it seems like maybe there's not as much known as there could be are, are there places where you feel like um, there or are, are there specific areas where you would like to see more research in, in terms of uh, helping uh, move our understanding about lymphedema? Mm. Well, certainly. I mean, certainly what we all want most of all is a cure. <laughs> so I would like nothing better than to be going through all this work to have these compression supplies covered for them someday to not even be needed. Um, and I do feel like in my son's lifetime, there will either be a cure or there will be significant advancements in our understanding and, you know, consequently how we treat and manage the disease. Just in his nine years of life, I've seen a lot of progress made already. Um, this has undoubtedly been an area that's been largely ignored by the medical and scientific community, um, and I think that's just now starting to change. We're starting to realize that this is not, first of all, this is not benign swelling. There are real consequences to all of this stagnant lymph fluid and that your lymphatic system is your immune system. This is really affecting your overall health. And there's so many connections that they're starting to, to see that exist between the lymphatic system and other systems of the body, other diseases, other organs, that there's just, uh, there's so much unknown still, but so much potential for learning that will, I think, ultimately benefit lymphedema patients a great deal. So um, I don't think there's one particular area of research um, that, that, you know, I, I personally would like to see advance the most. It's all important. Um, of course, I hope that there is a cure someday, um, but uh, in the meantime, until we have that cure or we have those advancements in treatment, it's just so important for today's patients to be able to manage their swelling and manage this the best they can. Um, and it really, you can live very well with lymphedema. My son has a completely healthy, happy, normal life because he's had the benefit of a timely diagnosis and access to treatment, but not all people do, and it's just um, unacceptable that in our country people um, have a treatable disease and they can't access that care that they need. Thank you, and, and I think um, what I would say is that, you know, what, what we are finding more and more is that this is uh, potentially a common side effect of breast cancer surgery for women diagnosed with breast cancer, and, and so it is something that is um, not rare, and um, it would be good to really understand how often it's happening, why why some women who go and have breast cancer surgery um, develop lymphedema later, and why others don't, to help us understand potentially the causes of secondary, um, sort of why secondary lymphoma develops. Um, and, and what to do about it. I think in terms of uh, thinking about sort of right now and addressing the needs of uh, women living with breast cancer and potentially who have lymphedema or potentially at risk of lymphedema, I think, like Heather said, it is really important to think about how to meet the needs of, of those people now while we also work um, to think about preventing it um, or curing it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think those are all sort of really, really important issues. Um, let me, I'm just going to look at the questions and make sure that we've gotten many. Um, so one, one question, I'm not sure if it's a question or just sort of a, a comment, but it, it's um, sort of speaking to the issue again around medical providers. Um, not being as educated about lymphedema, um, and that you know, for for patients and women who may be um, potentially at risk for developing secondary lymphedema, to have the the education and the information to be advocates for themselves. Um, and so, this this uh, one person in the audience uh, is suggesting and and trying to I think get, empower people to. Um, 
request a referral for a lymphedema evaluation by a trained expert. And um, you know, not everyone is going to have that ability to ask for an expert. Um, but if you know to ask, um, sometimes that is one of the first steps of, of saying, you know, I, I understand lymphedema is a potential risk given the surgery I just had. Uh, can we talk about uh, getting a evaluation? So thank thank you to the caller who uh, suggested that. So we. And I, I wanna, would just. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add. Yes. Hopefully, any patient that asks their doctor could get that referral from their physician. But if for some reason they cannot, um, we do have links on our resources page to a number of different lymphedema provider directories. These are not directories that our organization maintains, uh, but that other organizations maintain. And these are certified lymphedema therapists or physicians that specialize in the diagnosis and treatment of lymphedema. So if you're not able to get that referral through your doctor, you might be able to go to one of these directories find someone in your area and, and locate um, that care that way. Great. Thank you. So we're uh, at time. And so uh, I want to, uh, again, just thank everyone for their really thoughtful questions and comments. And if we didn't have a chance to answer your question today, or if you think of a question um, after you sort of sit with all this information we've given you, please feel free to follow up with us at info at bcaction.org. And thank you again for your time and your attention on the call. And I will be sending a, an email with a short survey where you can give us some feedback on this webinar and help us make our webinar program better and better. So thank you again. And I want to say thank you to Heather. And uh, please have a wonderful rest of your day and evening. <laughs>